The oldest university in Vietnam was founded in Hanoi in 1070, when most people in Europe were still walking around in bearskins. One of the few things we'll find out today on Roundtable Perspective with our discussion with Dr. Kim Sipes, sociology professor at Purdue Northwest. He's going to share his observations about contemporary Vietnam and the U.S. presence there and around the world. Please join me. Welcome to the Roundtable Perspective. I'm your host, Lee Arts, and I'm joined today by my guest, Dr. Kim Sipes from Purdue Northwest. Um, Dr. Sipes teaches sociology um, at our Westville campus. He's been a guest before, but today we're going to talk a bit about his uh, recent trips to Vietnam and um, also talk a little bit about some of his um, writings on the current global economy and uh, the U.S. empire. So welcome, Dr. Sipes. Thank you. Good to be here. Um, I understand that you were in Vietnam recently teaching a class. Can you talk a bit about that? Yes, I uh, had a, a couple of friends of mine had been out to Vietnam last year teaching in labor studies. The Vietnamese asked if they knew any Americans that might be willing to come out and teach. They gave them my name and they invited me out for a conference last year, uh, which I spoke, and things went so well they invited me to come back and teach again this summer. So you didn't make too many enemies the first time around. No, <laughs> I slid by. So the class you taught was on labor history? or No, it was on qualitative research methods. Okay. One of the things about Vietnam is the people that have gotten the uh, their higher education training, most of that was under the so old Soviet Union or the Russians. They're very strong on, on physical sciences, but they're, they're not as strong on the social sciences. So they wanted me to come out and help teach some of the students uh, research methods and hopefully work with the faculty, things like that. Um, this was the first time you were in Vietnam since your first uh, go round? Well, no, actually, uh, you're alluding to, to my time in the Marine Corps. I was in there in 69 to 73, but I lucked out and I was never sent uh, in the process of being on active duty, though I learned what was going on and I turned around, so I wouldn't have gone eventually anyway because I learned what we were doing over there. So this was, uh, last year was my first trip, so this was my second trip in country. Okay, can, can you just, I mean, we uh, American viewers, our viewers, um, probably know very little about the education system in Vietnam and you're, you, you're not an expert on the educational system, but you must have had some um, interaction at the university you were at um, with other professors and with the students. Could you just, um, they actually have higher education as well. Oh, absolutely. Saying. Okay. Um, this university that I taught at is called Tong Duc Tong University. It's in uh, Ho Chi Minh City, which is what they renamed Saigon. So it's the old Saigon. Uh, it's a modern university. It's only 20 years old, but they have the goal of being one of the top uh, 60 institutions in Asia within another 20 years. So they're bringing people in to train their students. This is the only university in Vietnam where students have to complete, uh, have to take a test in, in English to pass as a graduation requirement. So they So you teach, taught in English? I taught in English and we okay. had no translation. <laughs> and to make it a little more difficult, um, I was supposed to teach for eight weeks. And just before I went out, they sent me a message saying, we messed up and uh, our students are going on internship in July. So you have three weeks to teach your eight-week course. Oh, goodness. <laughs> so I had to tear everything apart and then um, uh, redesign it and things like this. Um, and I, they were not used to do working with foreigners, so I really didn't know the level of sociological training, the level of English. I didn't even know how many students I had until I walked into a room with 72 students. Oh, goodness. And so we went from there. But So I had to learn quickly, and, but the students were great. They really were there. They wanted to learn. They're very motivated. Um, and so we, I was teaching five hours a day, two days a week. Um, you said this is a new university, but yes. I, I thought in Ho Chi Minh City there was a university that predates... Uh... Well, that was in Hanoi. That was okay. one I traveled to. I'll, I'll tell you about that in a minute. 
But this one is, brand, is, like I say, very new, very modern. In fact, they have a library that our students would die to have. It's a brand new seven-story library, and the interior design was all done by students. Even the tables were designed by their students. It's beautiful. There's rooms for uh, group work, for video training. There's all kinds of things. It's just, it's just lovely. Um, a little different than what we've got, that's for sure, on both of our campuses. I, don't, I guess I don't understand how this is possible. Um, because in this, in this country, in this state, um, there are not resources to put up um, student designed or even anybody designed new buildings or seven story libraries. What, how do they have the resources to be able to afford something? Well, basically what happened after the war, uh, the U.S. had promised to make reparations to the Vietnamese, which we did not do at all. Uh, after that, we also uh, forced our allies not to trade with the Vietnamese. So eventually in 1986, the Vietnamese decided they had to bring in international capital. So they allowed foreign investment. There's a lot of foreign investment in Vietnam, mainly uh, exploiting the work of young workers. Uh, Nike's got 300,000 uh, Vietnamese workers under contract working for them. So out of this, at least what the government is doing is using some of this money to improve the society. They've drastically reduced uh, poverty and unemployment. I mean, it's still there. You can still see it, but it's, it's, it's uh, large, very much reduced. But they are putting money, at least in this university, for education. Uh, I've seen plans for the whole university. And they've, they're building even more buildings uh, that are coming up. So education is important. The Vietnamese know that if they're going to play a role in global academia, they have to speak English. They're training their students and making a major effort. This, is, this university clearly has a bunch of resources. I think we, we, we should try to make a very brief connection between uh, U.S. intervention in the 60s, 70s um, to stop communism. Right. And today, um, uh, Nike's uh, investing in building or making shoes in this country. It's, yeah. it's, uh, it's become a capitalist country with uh, Vietnamese um, characteristics. characteristics. Is that, I mean, because you're saying they use the uh, proceeds of investment to, for social programs like yeah. education and healthcare and the rest. But how is that, how does that exactly work? <laughs> Well, a lot of it I don't know. I mean, it's like any society, it's like an onion, and I've just started peeling a little bit off. Um, but one of the things is that the, everything we were told about Vietnam, and I learned this while I was on active duty in the Marine Corps, everything we had been told had been a conscious lie. Um, the struggle in Vietnam was not the communists coming in to take over. It was an effort to reunify their country. In fact, in 1954, after they defeated the French, there was an agreement that there would be a national election where people in the South could decide whether to join the North or stay an independent country, and, it, and that the South Vietnamese government illegally canceled that election, and the U.S. agreed. And if you read President Eisenhower's mem uh, memoirs, he says the reason we allowed that election to be, clo uh, be uh, canceled was that all of our intelligence was saying Ho Chi in a free election, Ho Chi Minh would have won 80% of the vote. It's not just fake news. We now have fake history. Yes. Because just like the Vietnamese that you're teaching weren't around in 1970, uh, most of the students and even many of the people that... Uh, you know, the average citizen is not somebody that has the experience of either the Vietnam War, nor the draft, nor the media coverage of that. So it's, uh, it's, it's, I find it interesting that it's full circle, that you're being invited back to teach qualitative research methods to a group of sociology students that are in a society where Nike is investing to make uh, shoes to sell um, globally after, I don't know, several decades of devastation. Uh, it's almost like a phoenix rising. It's, it's a weird, it, it, yeah, it's definitely a weird situation in that um, they've put the war behind them. The war ended over 40 years ago. Um, and for their young people, they don't know what's gone on because their parents and grandparents have told them it was a terrible time. And there's a lot they don't know. Um, you know, it was, it was strange for me, especially having been in the Marine Corps during this time, to be there 
The war's not something that's talked about. Although, like, a, um, I was in Europe in the early 1980s, 40 years after World War II, and they didn't talk about that either. So that seems to be a time where, all right, we can let that go. Um, but, you know, so I would tell people I was in the military and then I turned around when I found out what was going on and, and wouldn't have gone had they sent me. Fortunately, I was never challenged. But it's very, very different. But one of the things that we see is the Vietnamese are very open to, to foreigners. I was welcomed. I, was, I never suffered any uh, negativity. I mean, I'm sure some of the older people might have had things to say behind my back. I, I wouldn't preclude that. But it's really interesting. One of the most interesting things I found out about Vietnam, just a second, is that there, I, there were the cops in Vietnam, the ordinary street cops, did not wear guns. In fact, they didn't even wear police belts like we have. Uh, the only guns I saw in the country were in the banks. The bank guards had guns. But other than that, nobody else. That's, that's not surprising to me. I was in Turkey just a couple weeks before there was a... Uh, the explosion at the uh, airport, uh -huh. and I saw not only no cops with guns, I saw no cops in Istanbul for like a week. Wow! So yeah. it's uh, it's unusual comparing it to the U.S. I'm yeah. also glad to hear that you weren't the Marines there because um, I lost my closest friend in Vietnam, uh -huh. um, and he was killed by friendly fire from Marines when they were told to attack in a village where him and his uh, compatriots were uh, uh, doing doing some work. So um, many times uh, it takes an experience like that for us to um, reevaluate, re uh, which is very difficult, I would say, probably for, for many Americans that have had uh, uh, family members that have been in one war or another to be able to step back and make this, which may be one of the reasons we have to have more um, history, like the book that you wrote on the AFL-CIO. I think one of the difficulties that we face uh, as Americans is we always see the uh, the world through the lens of uh, being in this country with 300 million people, it's, its economy, and we don't often understand the connection between uh, how conditions are here, including economic and, and, uh, and social life, even the university system or all of the consumer goods, mm -hmm. and how that can exist in a world where there's essentially gross inequality. So, um, which leads me to your to the your most recent book, which was Building Global Labor Solidarity, mm -hmm. um, published a year ago by Haymarket Press. Yeah. Um, I'm struck by the idea that there should be global labor solidarity because my read on the world we live in is there is a global solidarity among corporations. Um, such that General Motors builds more cars in China than uh, they do in the United States, yeah. and the number one manufacturer of pork in the U.S. is a Chinese company. <laughs> so th th this idea that there's a solidarity across borders um, seems to me very pronounced, but certainly not among labor. So right. what was the, the thrust or the, uh, the findings in your book? Well, here's the thing is I've been studying what's changes in the global economy and how they have effect, uh, affected American workers. My first uh, academic publication was back in 1984 on this. And so I'm looking as the world's changing, trying to understand how that's affecting us. And one of the conclusions that I came to, it's a controversial conclusion, I'll admit. Oh, well, we love controversy here, so <laughs> give it to us. <laughs> but is, is I believe that, we, that, that you know, we're taught that the U.S. is an independent country, that it's separate, that it's unlike anybody else. We're better than everybody else. And I don't think that's accurate. I think what we have, I think the U.S. is the heartland of a U.S. empire. I think that the U.S. has tried to dominate the world since, especially since uh, 1945, the end of World War II. You can arguably go back to 1898 in the Spanish-American War. Um, but in doing this, that the U.S. has tried to dominate the world. Um, and what has happened over time, while that worked for a while, say into the early 70s, as, we've as, as corporations have started shifting their production, uh, overseas, whether it's China and Mexico, or whether they're replacing workers here, like in the steel industry with new modern equipment that's wiping out jobs and things like this, is they're putting their resources to dominate the world while we at home are not, are, they're taking the, the resources away. So, you know, like President Trump has, don't, has decided $700 billion for the war industry. I refuse to call it defense. We're not threatened by anybody. So, so what I'm seeing is that they are trying to dominate the world, 
But that money is money that can't be spent for uh, adequate health care. It can't, uh, can't, uh, can't be used for education. It can't be used to rebuild our infrastructure. It can't be used to, to address climate change or things like this. So in other words, that by, by the elites, the big boys and girls as I call them, by them trying to dominate the world, that's taking money away from the American people. And we know we need to create jobs that, that provide good incomes. And I just finished a paper on income inequality in this country. And for people at the bottom of our society, the bottom 20% of our population is making less money today in absolute terms than they made in 1973, 40 years plus. So nobody wants to talk about this stuff. And, and how long are these wars going to go on? We've been at war since 2001. We have never been told the truth. That's why we uh, attacked Afghanistan. We were never told why we invaded Iraq. I mean, the, the lies are so, f so futile, they're, they're, they're incredible. And yet we're still making Americans go to these countries. We're bombing, we're killing people, we're using drones. Every president is doing that. It goes, it's George Bush, George W. Bush, it's a Barack Obama, it's now Donald Trump. And what for? They're not, these countries ha are not and have never been a threat to the United States. What are we doing over there? Well, if you're, if you're going to talk about empire, I think the answer to what are we doing over there, and I would, first of all, I don't like the vocabulary of we because I don't consider that we are, I think they are. Okay. Um, because the question is, uh, who does the government represent? Um, and, and I don't think um, we necessarily draw an equal sign. Now, if somebody supports that, they can say we. But otherwise, okay. I, w I would make my distance from that. But I would say one I'll of the reasons that. that they're there is there are vital resources to making uh, to creating wealth. Either it's yes. uh, accumulation of wealth by dispossessing public resources or by um, being able to intervene with technology so that the, the, the workforce is more productive um, in terms of what can be created for the amount of uh, wages. So um, why would you be in Iraq? Well, I mean, the simple statement might be oil. Um, why would you be in Vietnam? The simple statement might be you can put machines up without having to pay taxes and you can pe get people to work for a buck and a half an hour. And then you can sell the shoes for 150 bucks a year. That's a big gap. Yes. So, it, I mean, I think it makes completely rational sense from the point of view of uh, world corporations why they need to interfere with um, any democracy or any shared public wealth. Okay, well, I, I understand that. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. But I would challenge you is around oil being the reason for us invading Iraq. I not, mean, not, not, no, not, not uh, I would say not specifically, but there is that benefit, and it doesn't go exactly to the U.S. I mean, the first, the first contract was given to Total, which is a French company, right. and the other one was to BP. But, but that, to me, again, speaks to the title of your book, that the transnational corporations have built uh, a global solidarity amongst themselves, so the U.S. troops may go to Iraq, but the French oil companies or the British oil companies yeah. will, will, we, will benefit from that. Okay, we can go further on that, but, but I want to go back to the labor side. And basically, one of the things we're understanding is that there is no national solutions to global problems. So if these corporations are moving around the world or if they are forcing corp company, uh, countries to let them have all their benefits for basically nothing, which they are doing, um, the only way that we can stop that is through a labor movement. Now, our labor movement has conceded a lot of it, but for activists, we're trying to find ways to link up with activists and, and workers and labor organizations around the world. And my research over the last 30 years has done this. As you know, most of my research has been in, in the Philippines, where most people don't even know there is a labor movement, but I would argue they've got one of the most dynamic and developed labor movements in the world. Now, I'm moving... How, how, well, I, I believe you. I mean, I know that you've done the research. And right. also, my, my question would be, would, how would the labor movement in the Philippines connect with the labor movement such as it is in China, connect with a labor movement in Mexico or a labor movement in the United States? Um, when, you're, when you're preparing the book, I'm assuming that there's a coda, there's a conclusion that talks about some broad outlines of how this solidarity, this interaction um, may work. 
Well, it, there are efforts, and there's some countries that are doing different. The, the KMU, the labor movement that I've studied in the Philippines, actually has an international solidarity affair every year where they invite workers and trade unions from around the world to come experience the real life of Filipinos. So, yes, there's some formal procedures at first, but the, but the clue is to get us out in the provinces or get us on the picket lines, talk to the workers, see what they're actually doing and experience and seeing what we can learn from them. I actually think, in fact, my article in the, in the book, one of my articles in the book is seeing what we can learn from the Filipinos. I think they have a tremendous amount of experience and there's much to be learned. Um, but I was also just in Canada last week. There was a conference on international labor solidarity and confronting global capital. Um, and one of the nice things there, it's unlike in the U.S., uh, they had trade unionists that were, that were there uh, and participating in the conference, learning, sharing, things like this. So I, had, I was on the opening plenary, and the man following me was the president of the Canadian uh, uh, Postal Workers Union, the National Union. So we were having interactions between inter, uh, activists and scholars and trade unionists, trying to find ways, where can we build solidarity, how can we build that, but with the conscious understanding we can't solve these problems alone. I see, I see that um, on, on the one hand, uh, when we read the media, there is not going to be a focus on what labor is doing in this country <laughs> or any other country, right? You got a business right. page, but there is no labor page, right. even though the majority of the population works for a paycheck. But um, I, I'm inspired, so to speak, by the longshoremen Right. Um, that on the one hand, one of their acts of solidarity was not to load or unload uh, materials that went to South Africa during apartheid and mm -hmm. was a major contributor to the removal of apartheid regime. And just recently, I, I noticed that the uh, Longshore Union in, in the Bay Area, right. um, rather than trying to find the, the, the fascist white supremacist groups and beat them up on the corner, they called for a major demonstration. And just the uh, idea of uh, 10,000 longshoremen and their allies being at the park that the, uh, that the white supremacist group was going to be at uh, convinced them that they should not come to the Bay Area, and they uh, walked away. So right. I think one of the things that your book does and one of the things that uh, participating in the conference like you're talking about does is uh, kind of cut through that... Uh, may not be fake news, but the absence of news yes. about where our interests are, who we actually are, and what might be done um, to change the wage, uh, wage conditions, working conditions, even mm -hmm. the climate conditions, if we are able to share these things across borders. So. Well, I think absolutely. And one of the things is, and, and you don't see it often, but your examples are, are very pertinent. And in fact, I have, to, uh, I have to say that I helped build the community support for that demonstration in 1984 where the, where the longshore workers in San Francisco refused to handle South African uh, cargo. But I mean, part of the thing about labor is that when it comes together, when it educates itself, when it communicates, it can be a strong force and could make major change. And there's no other force in society like that, in ours or any others. And I think it's very important to try to understand what's happening with labor, seeing what they're, uh, what they're doing, learning from them, transmitting this. How do we communicate this? How do we cross borders? How do we speak different languages? How do we work? Well, what I found is when you treat people with respect, they're open to talking to you. And I've traveled literally around the world. I've been to South Africa, I've been to Venezuela, I've been to the Philippines, I've been to Vietnam. And these are places where I've sat down and talked with workers, talked to people about how do we understand workers? How can we, how, how can we build this? And this idea of building global labor solidarity I think is very important. And it's being worked on today. Um, that's something that is not widely known. Um, even the concept of solidarity as a word is probably not widely known. In fact, I want to ask you to give me a, what, one of those uh, two-sentence definitions of what is solidarity, because it's a word that people use often, but uh, um, for the average person on the street, it's not a word that you hear, and it probably right. may not even make sense. So, <laughs> Well, I don't know if I can do this, but, but the concept basically is, is being concerned about more than yourself, of linking up with others, supporting them, giving them the confidence, the resources, the help you can to help them, and taking action to do that, not just saying platitudes, but actually 
acting in ways that help each other. And I think that's I think that's great. Seems like we always run out of time in these conversations, but that's the purpose of the show to ask questions and probe for answers. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have on our program. So thank you, Dr. Sipes, for joining me today on the Roundtable Perspective. I'm Lee Arts. I'll see you next time.